Hello, I'm Dr. Brenda Roman, Professor of Psychiatry and Director of Medical Student Education in the Department of Psychiatry at the Wright State University Boonshoff School of Medicine. I am going to answer some important questions about substance use disorders. One of the most frequently asked questions about drug use is, who is at most risk for developing a substance use disorder? There are many risk factors for substance use disorders. Let me touch on a few. First, genetics, sometimes called genetic predisposition. People with a family history of substance use disorders, especially males, generally have a higher rate of these problems, even accounting for environmental issues. Of course, being exposed to a family member's drinking or drug problem is a second time of, of risk. That sort of environment can produce uncertainty, confusion, and trauma. When one or more of these conditions are present while a child is growing up, they are certainly more at risk of developing a substance use disorder as an adult. A third type of risk besides genetic and childhood exposure to substance misuse is the presence of certain environmental conditions like the availability of psychoactive substances or cultural acceptance of drinking or drug use. In addition, emotional issues such as an underlying psychiatric disorder or general personality traits of impulsiveness or risk-taking increase a person's risk of substance use disorders. There's one additional risk factor that I want to mention. Individuals experiencing physical symptoms of pain because of an illness or injury are at a higher risk of developing substance use disorders. When people use their medication to get high, in addition to getting pain relief, they're at extremely high risk. How common are substance use disorders? There are several ways of answering this question. One way is to say that in 2009, almost 9% of the U.S. population, an estimated 22.5 million persons aged 12 or older, were classified with substance dependence or abuse in the past year. Of these, 3.2 million were classified with dependence on or abuse of both alcohol and illicit drugs. 3.9 million were dependent on or abused illicit drugs, but not alcohol. And 15.4 million, or 7.4% of the population, were dependent on or abused alcohol, but not illicit drugs. Another way of answering the question, how common are substance use disorders, is to say that 14.6% of American adults have had a substance use disorder in their lifetime. It may also be interesting to think of how common these disorders are by looking at what types of substances are involved, especially in light of the epidemic of prescription drug abuse. The proportion of all substance abuse treatment admissions aged 12 or older that reported any pain reliever abuse increased more than four times between 1998 and 2008. These increases in the number of people entering treatment who reported pain reliever abuse cut across age, gender, race, ethnicity, education, employment, and geographical region. As one might expect, substance use disorder prevalence rates are considerably higher for some people. For example, people who have other psychiatric disorders. Among psychiatric outpatients, current and lifetime rates of substance use disorders range from 20 to 40 percent. And among psychiatric inpatients, current and lifetime rates range from 40 to 60 percent. Rates of substance use disorders are also extremely high among incarcerated individuals, from 45 to 70 percent. These elevated rates are not surprising, given that multiple maladaptive behaviors and psychiatric disorders that lead to psychiatric hospitalization or incarceration also leave one vulnerable to substance use disorders. What kind of treatments are available for substance use disorders, and how effective are they? One way of looking at the different kinds of treatment is to look at the treatment context. That is, the conditions under which treatment is provided. At the most basic level, there is inpatient treatment and outpatient treatment. Short-term hospitalization is utilized for those people who need help getting through the physical withdrawal of drugs or alcohol. Long-term residential treatment is usually provided for people who need a controlled environment while they work on major changes in both their alcohol or drug use and other life areas that have been affected by their use. Such therapeutic communities focus on the re-socialization of the patient to a drug-free lifestyle. 
Outpatient treatment is highly variable depending on the needs of the patient and can include the use of medications in addition to therapy and support groups. Medications can include methadone or suboxone, which are both opioid-based medications that help users disengage from drug-seeking behavior while they become more receptive to behavioral treatment. Other medications, like naltrexone or clonidine, are non-opioid and help eliminate withdrawal symptoms and reduce craving. Most outpatient treatment, however, is non-pharmacologically based, using treat behavioral treatments and support. Besides looking at the conditions under which treatment is provided, we can examine the services that are provided regardless of settings, or we can look at the methods used. This way of looking at treatment ties in nicely with the part of the question about effectiveness. Because research has identified some specific services and methods that are associated with positive treatment outcomes. In a large nationwide study of drug treatment outcomes, clients showed significant improvements during a one-year follow-up in clients who participated in both inpatient and outpatient programs. Overall, major outcome indicators for drug use, illegal activities, and psychological distress were each reduced on average by about 50%. However, there were notable distinctions between clients admitted to different types of treatment, and there were further variations even between programs of the same general type, as well as the length of time they remained in treatment. Let's take a look at some features of treatment that seem to be closely tied to successful outcomes. Most effective treatment consists of detoxification if needed, therapy, and relapse prevention. Medication is an important component of detoxification. Detoxification is usually followed by a therapeutic process of identifying and examining behaviors that need changing and deciding on strategies for making those changes. Relapse prevention helps people continue to implement the behavior changes and is an important component of long-term success. Sometimes, like other chronic conditions, relapse of a substance use disorder requires a return to prior treatment components of detoxification and behavioral therapy. The most effective programs are composed of a continuum of care that includes a variety of services, a personal treatment regimen, addressing all aspects of an individual's life, including medical and mental health services, and follow-up options. For example, community or family recovery support. I also want to mention mutual help groups like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. AA and NA aren't considered treatment, but like community and family support, they generally are an important addition to a treatment regimen. Those support components can be crucial to a person's success in achieving and maintaining a drug-free lifestyle. Thanks for watching. I hope these questions and answers about substance use disorders and their treatment have been helpful, and I hope you'll tune in to other segments of our Prescription Drug Disorder series.